And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a few newcomers to the temple. Create the create the we have the programmer and co-creators of Jer of Journey to Ecria, and I'm going to apologize in advance if I butcher any pronunciations. Um, in <laughs> one, good. in one in one corner we have Il Il Lucia Kira Bodrova. In Hello. The, in the <laughs> second corner we have Je we have Jessica, and in the th in the third corner. Be the, in the quiet corner, we have Blaufrosch. Hi. How are, how are you all doing today? Or tonight, technically. <laughs> oh, we're doing great. Mm -hmm. Well, as great as we can do with uh, the current developments. Yeah. But yeah, we're, mm -hmm. we're fine. Everything is fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I... I like to open with the humble beginnings in this kind of thing. It's a bit of a tradition. So, what I'm curious, what I'm curious about is, since Journey to Ecria is is described itself as a role play driven board game, um, where did you where did you all kind kind of cut your proverbial teeth on um, on this sort of board gaming style and role playing as a whole? Um. Well, I'm I'm just gonna start. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Kira. Yes, hi. <laughs> uh, it started for me not with board games, but with role playing um, mm -hmm. in the direction of LARP. If you know what that is, yes. Yeah. When you dress up and fight with swords and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this since I was, I think, I started when I was sixteen. Mm -hmm. And um, so my main focus was always on the role playing part which I really enjoyed, and board games I've uh, played a lot from strate strategic to um, adventure and so on. Mm -hmm. I think the first one I played, besides the usual Monopoly and stuff, it was, uh, I, I think it's called Risk in, in English. It's yep. the one where you have the world map and have mm -hmm. to conquer. Yes, uh, that's what I started with, but I also enjoyed um, games like Munchkin, which is a huge inspiration for our game, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's m my part of the story, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. And what? Uh, what well, I'm more on the role-playing side of things, mm -hmm. like, but uh, the board game side. On the fantasy world stuff, I never was into the real life roleplay thingies. Uh, for me, it started out with uh, Magic the Gathering, actually. I'm a huge Magic fan and I have a way too huge collection. So, yeah, card games are pretty high up on my list. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think um, of the three of us, I'm actually the one most distant to board or card games. I mean, I've played in the past, like family board games, Monopoly, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if it's actually called like that um, in English, but um, we have Bonanza, um, which is like a farming strategy kind of game mm -hmm. um, with beans. And yeah, so a little bit of um, pen and paper, I've dabbled into that and um, played a fair share of Yu-Gi-Oh! when I was a child. But mm -hmm. other than that, I'm more of an um, RPG enthusiast when mm -hmm. it comes to um, video games. So yeah. not the physical games. But yeah, it's never too late to start. Yeah. Now, when it can... what I find interesting about that is with, with the three of you, that's three different, um, ba that's three different backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. and before, before I delve, before I delve deep into, deep into that, I just have to get one bad joke out of the way. Jessica, I hope you weren't one of those evil people who ran sliver decks back in the day. <laughs> I might have been. You did. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very cute though. 
It you know sounds what? like snakes. <laughs> I... Did you just say they're cute? <laughs> oh, there. You know, I could, but... No, no. <laughs> um, I could. But... We're not easily offended. <laughs> <laughs> look, look. It's it's been it's one of the it's been one of those running gags for years because ev because everybody hated slip everybody hated sliver decks for for just flood for just flooding the whole for just flooding the whole field with with a bunch of with a bunch of cheapos um and and some other things that slivers could do that could that could drive people up a wall so it's it's one of those it's one of those running gags um. But when but what I find it, what I find interesting about the, about this combination of backgrounds is you see some of that you see some of that DNA within the within the um, full within the full on product with um, Journey and with that in, with that in mind how did the how did the initial spark to to create Journey to Acrea really get started. Um, so it was one of those stories where we had an assignment in our university, uh, mm -hmm. Jessica and I were in the same course mm -hmm. and we had to create a business idea concerning our uh, prof future profession and, um, do a bunch of stuff for it. And we had a lot of, um, we did a lot of brainstorming and made a mind map and so on. One of the ideas was actually um, a weird app where you you throw a tiny human in a in a uh, rubber cell. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a bit weird. <laughs> the ideas we had and from it, Genital Cryer actually came to life. It was first. It was just um, let let us make a card game with. Um, with um with an rpg style we mm -hmm. that was the main idea we had nothing specific and from the, that we started working part time on on what we had to do for the assignment and part time we just did much more because the idea the more we spent time on, on it the more we were um motivated to make something real out of it because it we got great feedback that it sounds really cool mm -hmm. and yeah th that's how it started <laughs> yep. now with it now within the within the uh, setup that you that you that you all have with the with the whole um, em emphasis on mo on he on heroes moving towards a de towards a destination on that um what would you say were some of the were some of the board games that you all took inspiration from? Um, I actually had a list once, but mm -hmm. I'm totally unprepared today, <laughs> as always. Uh, <laughs> uh, as as I mentioned earlier, um, Munchkin was one of mm -hmm. the inspirations. That was uh, for the combat style. We didn't copy it, but. Mm -hmm. We like the idea that you encounter a creature and it can be something strong or something weak. You you don't know it. It's, mm -hmm. it's just how how the pile is mixed. Yep. Um, another one. Uh, our cards are inspired by magic since uh, Jessica, our main designer, <laughs> spent so many years on it. She uh, has a pretty good idea of how um, of what works with people mm -hmm. and what what. Is good, let's say. So, um, if if you look at our cards with the flavor text and how we distribute the stats and so on, um, the names, um, they're they're all a bit similar to, um, not not similar. They're inspired by Magic, the Gathering, and uh, another one was this um, the Starfarers of Catan, I think. Not not the settlers, but yep. the, the spaceship game, um, because there you get encounters where um, where um, you don't know 
what the encounter is, then you have mm -hmm. to blindly decide. Um, where you have to blindly decide whether uh, what what you want to do, and from these base ideas, we created our own. Mm -hmm. um, meaning that in our game, you you have a game master who t um, describes the creature or the place you're encountering, and you decide decide based on this that mm -hmm. whether or not you want to encounter them. And I think I'm starting to ramble, so. I'm just going to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes when it comes to the like when it co sometimes when I've seen sometimes when I've seen board games that do a game master approach, um, they typically have it as 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 it its own its own separate um, person do, person handling that approach entirely especially with asymmetric board games is is Ecrea one of the, one of those kind of experiences where one per, where one person at the table is going to be acting as the GM or is that a shared experience um no, wait, that was one of the okay. things we you want to answer oh no no you you can i don't have to talk the whole the time <laughs> <laughs> okay then i do uh like that's one of the things i personally really didn't enjoy when I was in a D&D &D group. Like, this one person always had to take the DM job, and they always had to, like, prepare for hours and read all these stupid monster manuals, and it didn't seem like it was fun for her, and I personally would have not wanted to be that person to just, yeah, spend all this time preparing and setting up stuff, and it seemed like such a hassle, so I was like, okay, that's... uh. Not a fun thing, so how about we split that up and actually every person gets to contribute something to the story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you are, you are either the active player or you are the current game master. Or if it's more than two players, like three or four players, you are one of the two who have a little bit of downtime. Mm -hmm. But we try to keep that to a minimum with the switching uh, game master role. Yeah. Now... It's interesting that you that you mention um, ma that you mentioned magic as as one of as one of your introductions, and I can definitely see the, I can definitely see the magic influence when it comes to the card designs. Um, well, what well with the well with the use of flavor text, factions, and and the like, but one thing that I don't see, one thing that I don't see is the is a resource equivalent when it when it comes to how, when it comes to how effect how, how effects work um would it be fair of me to say that you didn't want to run into the same problem that magic has with its land system well it uh, would have added another difficulty let's say to our game another level of difficulty mm -hmm. Where you have to manage your mana pool and all that and uh, it limits uh, your your options mm -hmm. like if you only have one mana uh, untapped, you can only do so much, and you yeah. constantly have cards on your hand you can't use, and this kind of thing mm -hmm. is one of the few aspects in Magic that make it um, not very friendly for more casual players or new players. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of friends I try to introduce to the, um, to the game struggle with that, so we figured we'd make our game uh, well more approachable in that aspect. Mm -hmm. It should be something that can be played with a group where you're not just hardcore gamers, but some casual people too. Mm -hmm. That's why we made it so that the role-playing aspects can be kept to a minimum, but the group can go fall out on it either way. Yeah. So, yeah. And when it comes... Um, is what... Is, um, when the main the main thing that I had that I had saw when it came when it came to the the setup on the board is obvi obviously the um, inventory system, which definitely fits the whole uh, um, equi equipping ca equipping uh, characters. Um, with the with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, With the with um equ with equipment, something I'm cu I'm curious about because you ha you've got two weapon slots and three um and three non and three non weapon slots. What 
was that the was that the initial intent to have to have it separated like that, or at some point did you have it that you just have five equipment slots? Period. No, actually, that was um, that was a separation I had made mm -hmm. from the start. Mm -hmm. I basically went off on the um, gaming experience, like uh, video games with mm -hmm. the typical RPG thing. You have two hands, you can carry two weapons or a weapon and shield, and you have your uh, your armor slots. Mm -hmm. So that's what something I like took from all those RPG games I greatly enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Now. Now, when it comes to the fa when it comes to the faction system that that the game has, where you have um, three factions being the restless, the wildlife, and the cutthroats, um, is it one of those things where the where um the f where the faction being focused on would ha would have to be decided at the start? Because I've seen that in some adventure games. Um. It's uh, like the factions are for the, let's say, enemy creatures mm -hmm. you encounter on that cursed mountain, and like uh, your hero personally isn't part of any of these factions. They are just um, a separation for the for the different kind of uh, monsters or creatures you can encounter. So mm -hmm. you have a bit of a, a basic set for each of those. Like the, the restless, they are all uh, undead, horror, creepy things, ghosts, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you always uh, find these kind of creatures within that faction. So it was more of a separation for the for the enemy types. So the player has a general idea about those. Yeah. Now, but yeah, you can good. encounter every um, every type of those factions in mm -hmm. one game and. Most likely will, since the cards are all shuffled. Um, they only. Um, then again, there's not like much of a difficulty difference. There are harder creatures in each faction, and easier creatures, also in each faction. But they actually make a little bit of a difference on your build craft. So the items that you equip. Now, when now when it can, another concept that I was that was curious about your about your um mindset with, when putting this in is the concept of the four elements. Uh, and those are the yeah for the heroes. Mm -hmm. I basically uh, I wanted to make the heroes unique, but I still wanted um, to have a certain impact on play style when you pick um, a certain hero. Like you just, uh, you just basically you see their pictures, you mm -hmm. read their names, and you're like, okay, that's yeah, that's a hero, awesome. That's a hero, awesome. Mm -hmm. You just pick. Uh, um, usually, people just pick based on like on looks or something like that. Some read the effects when we were play testing, but most just yeah, whatever. I take this one. Oh. And with the elements, it's mm -hmm. like uh, you can adjust the hero you pick to your play style. Like mm -hmm. um, for example, the light element heroes. They, uh, the element gives you a basic idea about the hero's goals and beliefs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the light heroes, for example, they get uh, they get benefits from assisting other heroes in battles. And uh, other elements do not. Uh, for example, the venom type heroes, they can actually harm other heroes in the game. Mm -hmm. So you can pick that based on whether you're the like... The kind of player that likes to be, you know, all friendly, helping others, or just let me murder my peeves. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's, it's it's called the Roman handshake. You know, you shake yes. with the you shake with the left hand, and you backstab with the right. That kind of thing, yes. Oh. Uh, the other, uh, the other thing I. But something I do find interesting when it, when I look at um in, when I look at encounter and some and some of the other um card effects is the is the emphasis on the on the die roll. Now, with that in mind, would it would it be fair of me to say that the majority of the time that you're going to be rolling die, you're only rolling a single d6? Yes, that's actually true. We uh, we didn't have anything else implemented so mm -hmm. far. And when it when it comes now when it comes to the 
when it comes when it comes to each um, phase, and I do I do see that the uh, the person filling in the GM role is basically the person whose turn it is next. Yes. Um, what I'm cu what I'm cur what I'm curious about what I'm curious about is because you mentioned because you mentioned with each of, with each of the el with each of the elements, and I'm cu I'm curious, um, what so what sort of in a given how given how magic was brought up earlier with each of the elements in in magic you can you can kind of make a guess as to what as to what a um pl as to what play style a, de a deck will have based on the type of mana that it'll use yeah like say if some if somebody's running a red focused deck you kind of have an idea on what they're going to do they're going to tr they're going to try and um o overwhelm and be and just and just beat you with brute force um is there is there a is there a similar kind of theme with the with the elements where if some if if somebody's using a storm hero it'll it'll reflect a bit into their play style? Uh, that was that was the idea, yeah, and it's actually meant as a little bit of a help to you know the players who are not mm -hmm. that into role play. Maybe they didn't have the uh, experience with D and D and stuff like that before. Mm -hmm. So they get, um, if they want to, they get a basic uh, mindset for the hero. Like these four elements, they are um, attuned to a certain god, um, god or goddess in this universe. Mm -hmm. And you can basically, uh, well, you can account certain attributes to that god. And so you can just shape your hero around that basic idea. You don't have to uh, come up with something completely on your own. Uh, at the same time, we leave it open. So you only because you're playing a storm hero doesn't mean you have to choose the chaos option all the time. Um, we we can't force the players to do so. First mm -hmm. of all, <laughs> um, that's one reason. And the second one is um, we want to make it as friendly for new newcomers as possible, but interesting for long term players too. So we leave this this option open, yep. and we give you all the input. Like uh, the storm de deity is someone, um, and and people who follow them are uh, very prone to just choosing very destructive, not really evil options, but rather um, it's it's like the the chaotic neutral, you know. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And with. Now, when it come now, wh when it came to when it came to te when it came to testing out one one of the things that I that I saw that really grabbed my attention. I've I've seen I've seen some game I've seen some games do I've seen some games do this or use a similar matter. But you had put you had set up a beta on Tabletop Simulator. Now I've been seeing. Yeah. I've, um, was that one of the ideas that came that came around early on, and how how did the idea come about to put out a beta version on that particular um, software? We actually had a bit of a yeah well problem, let's call it. We started out with the playtesting mm -hmm. sessions in our university rooms, mm -hmm. and we did it face to face with people we found uh, randomly in a city that were just interested in the game. That worked really well, but then yeah, you um, know, March and happened the in pandemic March. and stuff so yeah. that was impossible mm -hmm. <laughs> we basically got into a lockdown and um yeah the university closed down so we couldn't well basically we couldn't play test anymore at all except for online and uh, print and play isn't exactly that yeah we don't even have a printer i don't have one at my home so <laughs> uh tabletop simulator seemed like a good option and mm -hmm. it wasn't that hard to set up uh kira did most of that, so... Yeah. Since yeah, we already awesome. owned the game, um, it w and, yeah. We heard about Tabletopia, so um, mm -hmm. that's a nice option, too. Uh, yeah. We didn't know that there was, like, a free version of Tabletop Simulator out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Now, when it comes... Now, um... Since some, since some of you are are ver, are versed in are versed in some of the lexicon of role playing, I'm I'm get I'm guessing that, I'm guessing that you're you're probably familiar with the with the term Monty Hall. Um, when it com when it comes to when it came when it came to balancing 
journey to what um was there was there was there ever a concern that some that somebody might get a little too lucky when it comes to getting tr getting too much um treasure and ca and causing the Monty Hall problem? Uh we actually mm -hmm. I think it was the third revision now of the cards. We uh, put a lot of thought into the balancing stuff, and it's uh, with the playtesting. Mm -hmm. We uh, got a lot of four-player games in, and those usually work pretty well. We have some difficulties with balancing it for the two players because of the, uh, uh, the different chances of drawing certain things. But we didn't encounter any games so far where things just went completely out of hand. It's usually uh, pretty even between the players. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of card fluctuation where you have to uh, discard stuff. And it's not always based on your stats. Sometimes it's just bad luck. If you encounter a certain foe, you just have to discard something, no matter how strong you are. So you can't just... Uh, yeah, you can't be that OP and keep it up. You have to... Um, switch stuff out whether you like to or not. Mm -hmm. Also, um, you, you have a maximum hand uh, uh, the maximum hand card size, I think that, that's mm -hmm. the way you say it. Uh, you can only have five cards at the end of your turn, but usually it's less. And if you have, let's say, dead cards, the ones you can't, you uh, the ones that are useless to you right now, uh, we've um, added a new mechanic in the last revision that you can throw away three cards and get one new for that, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we try to add a lot of, as Jessica already said, try to add a lot of um, movement on the hand cards to the game. Yeah, it, it it's some, it's something I can I can I can dig, and again I I call my I end up calling back to, oh ma magic with it with the with the fact that I don't I don't know I don't know if you ended up using e either of these rules Je Jessica, but we had the we had the um, rule called mana called um first turn mana drop, um, so the f first time you draw first time you draw your hand any lands that you e ended up getting you put you put them out immediately. You know, just because we didn't want anybody getting getting screwed or flooded when it came to lands. Yeah, seems fair enough. Um. Som sometimes we do seven card draw just to just for the sh just for sheer insanity's sake. <laughs> but when it now when it comes now um one of the, one of the things that. In in a lot of in a lot of the in a lot of the images I did I didn't um, see see was the was the notion of um, pl of pl of player spells and when it and when it comes to the, when it comes to those there is the is the resource based on them just not, just on the notion of this is how, this is how many you can, this is um. You, you're limited by your hand your hand size and whether or not you'd want to use something now or later or mm -hmm. is there or are there going to be other limitations uh, basically we wanted to avoid the like the resource system with mm -hmm. like mana or something similar so uh, in the lore of the game it's basically uh, those people capable of magic are those uh, actually touched by one of the four main gods mm -hmm. And they belong to those elements. And the heroes we uh, get to choose from in the game are all touched by these gods. So they all are, um, they all have magical abilities. And that makes them all able to use the spells we uh, we have on the cards, on the treasure cards. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to put a, specially, a special resource for that into the game, yes. Yeah. So yes, so your first version, this, the one you said first, that it's limited by your hand... Um, yeah, hand cards and uh, whether or not you want to use it now or maybe save it for a stronger enemy. Mm -hmm. There are certain cards that have uh, different effects depending on what element you are. Like, for example, some cards can't be used by uh, darkness heroes. They just have to discard them. It's like uh, pretty shiny, beautiful things from, I don't know, a priestess or something. They're like, yeah, oh no, it burns and throw it away right away. And some spells are stronger in certain elements, but basically everyone uh, is able to use all the spells. And there's some 
uh, just some items with limitations that can't be used by a certain element hero. Mm -hmm. um, Blaufrosh, it sounded like you were, you were about to say something for, for a second. Yeah, I was just going to draw the comparison to pen and paper games where you usually have um, spell slots on your um, magical classes mm -hmm. that we don't actually have a system like that. And then um, bring the focus to, I don't know, a game like Skyrim, where you can actually um, find scrolls um, scattered throughout the tombs and dungeons um, that you explore. And um, those are basically one-use items, and you can think of the spells um, and other usables that we have um, more in that kind of manner. Which definitely, um, definitely makes sense. Um, now, when it can, now, if I rec now, if I recall, earlier you had mentioned that um, that when it comes when it comes to you when it comes to having two two or so pl two players that um, the balancing tends to be a bit different. Um, I know that the game is designed for two to four players, but would you would you say it's a case where the ga where the game is at, the game is at its most comfortable when you have eight when you have a f when you have four players at the table um in personal opinion and experience uh, i think that it's most enjoyable with four or three players mm -hmm. with two it's um well, you have less downtime that's good and it's quicker of course because there are less players but um with a fuller team, there's uh, first more input from everyone. So it's not just two people design, designing the world and building the story, but uh, three or four. Also, uh, from the, the cards are better, um, not, not better, but uh, not better distributed, but um, it's a chance thing. Mm -hmm. If you have only two players, uh, the chance to get a card are a bit no, not even not higher. It's lower because the, you're slower to go through the, the the treasure pile. So the cool mm -hmm. items you had to throw away on until you ha uh, you have the chance to get them again. A lot of time passes, so it's harder if you're only two, in my personal opinion. But um, yeah, you actually get to see a lot more if you're with more players. Mm -hmm. yes. So I think that's also one thing that's super cool because if you're already like fully equipped and you get an item that maybe doesn't um, fit your style, if you were three or four players, another player might actually draw that item. And even though it looks cool to you, you couldn't have used it with two players because you're already set mostly on your build or something. Yeah. Now, I do want to ask on, on the note on the notion of a of a digital of a digital version um, now i know that there's of course the version on tabletop simulator but when it comes to that digital version is that is that going to be a compl would that be a complete standalone um, affair uh, yes that's yes. <laughs> um, planned as a standalone affair mm -hmm. so um, basically um, for us we focus of course on the physical version um, especially Jessica and Kira, because that's where it all started. And I think um, the um, sitting together with your friends is a lot more fun, but that's not always possible. Um, so the digital version, I think, can add a lot, but um, you definitely don't need the physical version to make the digital version work. It's all, yeah, as mm -hmm. you said, completely standalone. In the digital version, you actually have the um, the ability to play alone. You can mm -hmm. just uh, play against the computer because that uh, can take over the role of the um, the game master for you. So that's something you can't really do with the physical version because yeah, the the um, switching GM also is something that requires at least two players. Otherwise, well, yeah, y you can't just blindly <laughs> pick. <laughs> Well, you could, but I think that would be... You already fun. see what's happening. So. Yeah. Um, 
Give, also, given the given the hero, given the whole thing with with picking out heroes, I'm I'm curious if anybody if anybody ever tried out and testing doing a a um randomized approach, i.e. everybody just ta everybody just takes one the top card off the hero the um deck of heroes and that's the one that they've got. Uh, that's what we usually do when playtesting because we know all the heroes and we don't have favorites. Well, I do, but the other two don't have favorites. <laughs> uh, so, so we just uh, usually pick one that we haven't played often or we just take the uh, top player. But mm -hmm. with our playtesters, they usually read all the cards and decide which one they they like most from their stats, from their alignment. I think it's also important for us um, because, I mean, it's still kind of hard, like as developer to be like as objective as possible, mm -hmm. because I mean, we are subjective, um, we are biased, um, but um, for us, it's important to keep in perspective on all the different heroes, especially on the different elements. Um, so we can, yeah, work with that a little bit more. Yeah. Now. Some, now, some something else that uh, something else that I'm curious about when it comes to the flow of it is obvious. Obviously, um, throughout throughout the journey, there are um, if, there are encounters and there are events. And from a design perspective, where where did you draw the line as far as what the theme of a encounter should be versus the theme of a event? Charlie, the events were added into the game mm -hmm. a little bit later. Um, the basic game just had the encounter phase mm -hmm. without events at all. And during the playtesting, we discovered that maybe there's um, there's something missing and we wanted another element in there, something that had more global effects, something that um, actually engaged all players in one player's um, active turn. Mm -hmm. And the events, they can do that. They are basically can have um, effects such as um, target a certain element or target like the the first player on the board or one player and all players behind or in front of them or they can just uh, target everyone. It's, yeah, the, the encounters are limited to that one active player and the GM. And when it... The other thing that I noticed with with a lot of the cards is is a um, is a cho is a choose two options approach. Yes, that ties into the role play aspect mm -hmm. again. We didn't want to make it um, as overwhelming as in D and D, where you just can choose freely on whatever mm -hmm. the hell you want to do. Mm -hmm. You can to com uh, can do completely random, completely stupid stuff, and yeah, we wanted to take that out, but we still wanted players to have a choice. Mm -hmm. But not to to overwhelm them with the choices. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, figured that would work. Now, I'd be remiss if I did if I didn't if I didn't discuss art if I didn't discuss art. And what I'm curious about is what was when it came to the, when it came to the art was there was it an instance where you where um where you went where where you ended up making pe making pieces for the for the um for the cards and then and then make and then making the rules based on how those turned out or was it the other way around it was the other way around mm -hmm. i uh, finished designing all the mm -hmm. cards and i actually named them and everything and after i uh, sat down and made mood boards for all of the cards and then i started sketching made mm -hmm. thumbnails and did the line works based on that i uh, i had a basic idea in mind when I created the card ideas, but it changed around a lot, and yeah, the the art comes later after the idea. Yeah. Um, were there any examples you can you can think of of a um, of a an I of an idea that you had at the start, but when you but when you finally finished that get that given card or, or the like, the idea tur turned into something not as closely associated with, with it, just be just because of things that could ha that could happen in development. Happened on occasion, but uh, we try to make it fit somehow. And uh, I don't think. It's... 
our sorry for interrupting, but one of our end bosses. Um, we first had an idea of a dragon, but finally, from the designs, it became a huge elk. I think elk or deer, male mm -hmm. deer. Um, so yeah, sh uh, she created a whole mood board and ideas for it, and mm -hmm. finally, it was something completely different. Yeah. It just uh, it tied in better with the with the storyline and with the faction it was associated to. So we yeah we ended up switching that around a bit. Mm -hmm. um, now one now within the rule book one of the things I I saw that was hinted at was a was a lore book. Um, mm -hmm. Is that it? Now is that is that some is that something that's still that's still going to be in the, in the cards or was that something that was kicked around at the time uh we still um, want to would like to do that very mm -hmm. much um mostly me because i'm the well the designer the lore person i created the universe the characters mm -hmm. and all that and i i i tend to get lost in in doing that and creating fantasy worlds and uh writing characters backstories and stuff mm -hmm. like that so mm -hmm. i do want to um offer uh, the ability for players to like read into the lore to get uh, a deeper insight, but it's not it's not something that you have to do. You don't like uh, have to read the whole monster manual like in D and D. But if you want to dive into the world more, you can sit down and read a lore book. So mm -hmm. we would very much like to include that still in the next Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. Um. I know, I know you. I know you mentioned you have way too many magic cards, but I'm curious if you had any of the, if you had any of the magic novels in, in that in that regard. I actually do. I think the Dark Steel ones, but I never finished reading them. I have the the magic art books. Those are amazing. Um, well, it's not like I'm one to talk. I have the ent I have the entire Kamigawa cycles um, books. So. Yeah, I have that one that decided to go all heretical and not and 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 not favor any sort of gold cards because, well, somebody has to. <laughs> but when it came when it came to when it comes when it comes to playtime, it it was mentioned that it that it's um around sixty minutes, um. During playtesting, have you had have you had cases where where it ended up going under that? Actually, oh. it's um, the 60 minutes is more like the, the minimum time. Mm -hmm. Like if you uh, keep the role playing aspects to a minimum, if you don't want to engage in that and you just like uh, focus on the stats, on the fights, and then, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you avoid the whole creating story aspect. It can actually go a lot longer. We had mm -hmm. that a lot. Especially if people, uh, like, if you were friends and you tend to talk about different stuff meanwhile, and yeah, it, it can drag on a lot, but it was still fun. So mm -hmm. that was something we uh, paid a lot of attention to. And it, it doesn't end up like some games where you just have to, like, split it into, into uh, a couple days of sessions because it's just such mm -hmm. a huge, yeah, such a huge amount of time that gets consumed by it. Yeah. And uh, we never had a session under 60 minutes, I think. We, we yeah. got close with the two players when we avoided the role play. We were just, you know, wanted to get to testing quickly. Mm -hmm. Then we had 45 minutes once, I think. But otherwise, it was uh, mostly more than 60. Yeah, and we both know the game, so um, it's not really a good measure that mm -hmm. uh, we two managed to do it in 45 <laughs> minutes uh but yeah it's usually about um an hour if you play short or if you play with um in a full team it, like four people and with the game um role playing aspect it's usually around four hours three to four mm -hmm. sometimes two depending on yeah it, it just depends on the players and how long they take to make their turn now this wasn't this wasn't delved into in the in the rule book, but I'm cu I'm curious if there were any sort of um, optional rules that were ki that were kicked around during development. Well, we have a lot of ideas mm -hmm. that we still want to implement, but we don't want to make it too difficult. We don't want to make um, 
add too many layers to it to make mm -hmm. it unapproachable for casual gamers. Yeah. Uh, we also don't want it to make uh, to be boring for like players with a lot of experience in that kind of regard. But mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's somewhat of a balanced struggle. We um we toyed with the idea of including something like quest cards for a hard mode. But we haven't decided on that yet fully. We might end uh, up adding something like that in the next Kickstarter because people actually gave us a lot of feedback on that mm -hmm. that they would like, uh, would greatly enjoy it if we had more content in the game mm -hmm. and to improve the replayability. So quest cards might be able to do that. So yeah. we are still toying around with that. I could I could see I could see I could see quests being being used as a sort of Difficult difficulty tweak for people, um, i.e., i.e., making a certain aspect easier but a certain aspect more difficult. Um, say, say for say for instance, if somebody wanted to do 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 an approach do an approach of 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 um of what what I will call because of my gimmick, what I will call the monk build, i.e. You can you can have up to you can have up to five equi equipments, but you can't carry weapons. You know because monks are gonna go barehanded. Mm. That oh. sounds fun. <laughs> that's yeah. That's with the with the setup of the two weapon or shield slots, you could. Well, you could only have three equipments then. Mm -hmm. That would make it a bit harder on you. <laughs> If you don't want to use weapons at all, you can just like I mean you could equip two shields, but yeah. <laughs> the well, the whole barehanded approach isn't really something we had yeah. considered. Um I'm just I'm just throwing that I'm just throwing that as an as an ex as an example when I mentioned the whole um difficulty tweak. Mm -hmm. Um and because and obviously, it, obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, tr I wouldn't try and implement that that straight. I'd, it'd have to be, it, it'd have to be iterated on to fil to filter out the parts that don't work. But when when it comes to, now, when it comes to obviously, um, you you all are set, you all are set to relaunch the the um, Kickstarter, um. Mid midway through midway through ne midway through next year. Now, I know th I know that you that you had to you had to um you had to stop the fu you had to stop the funding in, in this in, in this initial um round. But what were what were when it came to when it came to feedback when testing? What were some of the big takeaways you had got you had gotten when um. When people when people had a chance to actually try it out through TTS, we, um, uh, we got a lot of positive feedbacks, mm -hmm. and uh, people mostly enjoyed the game. But some people, um, especially those who like review board games and you know, play a lot of them, obviously, they saw a lot of issues with the replayability because mm -hmm. if you um, have it in your shelf and you keep playing it again and again, you might be able to predict certain outcomes. If uh, the GM isn't very creative with narrating the cards, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we got the feedback that maybe with the um, with the limit of cards we have right now, around uh, 125, it's just not that much cards. It could be more, um, but it's a limitation we are set to because well, we're just three people, and Kira and I need to do the whole artworks and everything. So mm -hmm. yeah, and balancing of the cards too. <laughs> With a bigger team, it might have been a great idea, or for um, like expansion, mm -hmm. if the game gets funded next time, that would be also something we'd gladly make. But yeah, Not it's just a limitation we're set to right now. Mm -hmm. uh, that aside, we got a lot of feedback um, about the. GM mechanic, people actually really enjoyed that, that mm -hmm. that switched and not just one person is stuck with it the whole time. Everybody gets to play, to be the hero, mm -hmm. their own hero, and to um, narrate story, uh, story parts, but they don't have to like make up everything by themselves. That was something that was really well received, so... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Also from people that were actually skeptical in the beginning about the whole narration thing. Um, we actually had one group... Um, 
that we play tested live with um, before Corona, mm-hmm. and they were really skeptical. They were not um, RPG players at all, and they really warmed up to the idea after one or two rounds. And, and they they ended up having a load of fun and laughing yeah. all the time, and it, it mm-hmm. was visible that they enjoyed the game. So that was really like it was a moment for us. Where we were like, oh, look at that! Even casual players like a game. We're doing something right. <laughs> And I, I um, at the at the very at the very least at the very least, um, a game like a game like this isn't go, isn't going to isn't going to have the the issue of the many deaths of the bard. <laughs> yeah, because you can't die. <laughs> that's that's a um, you, you never die in the game. You only get unconscious i'm sorry for interrupting if you want to to say something else yeah okay um yeah so you, you don't die in our game you get a setback if you lose all your life points you have mm-hmm. to throw away some equipment but you can continue on your journey and try again you get set back to um a camp on the game board those act like little save points and uh, every few felt, uh, every few fields, you have one of those campsites, and your basically character falls unconscious if he takes too much damage and gets transported back to the lost camp, and can keep on walking from there. Mm-hmm. And when it comes, and when it comes to. Um... With that, with that kind of thing in mind, would it be fa- would it be fair to say that Ekra is more is more of a is that um that the re- that the real re- the real um resource when it comes to Ek- when it comes to Ekria is time because obviously everybody everybody's trying to get to the Forgotten City first. It's um it's time as well as uh, hand cards. Mm-hmm. You want to get to the top of the mountain first so you can face the final boss. Mm-hmm. But you also need uh, you need decent equipment. You need your strength, and you need some good hand cards. Maybe have a trinket or a spell equipped, uh, trinket equipped or a spell on your hand. And you still need to be, have a little bit of luck. For example, if you build uh, your equipment to be very strong against the Cutthroat faction, and you end up encountering the Restless faction final boss, you might end up getting your ass handed to you, even though you did pretty well in the game before. Mm-hmm. So yeah, time definitely is um, of the essence, but even if you make it to the top uh, as first player, you can still get thrown back to the last camp because you just, in this very moment, you're not strong enough to defeat that very boss, and then you still have a chance of a few rounds to like... Um, change your equipment around or collect new spell cards to empower yourself once you reach the boss again. But during that time, the other players have the, um, have the chance, of course, to get to the top uh, before you again and, like, kill the thing. Mm-hmm. Whoever managed to defeat it first is the winner, not the one who is at the top first. Yeah. Um, and with, and take, taking that, taking that into 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 account um how would how would you how would you end up where there when it came to early designs were there ever instances of some of some of a um tie happening or was that just or is that just not a thing that came up um ties can happen with encounters it's Mm -hmm. uh part of the game mechanic if you actually um, end up with a draw with the creature you're facing, you and the GM roll against each other, and the higher roll wins. Uh, at the final boss, you can uh, encounter a draw as well, but you need to be stronger than it. As a, um, with the final boss, you can't win with a draw. You always have to defeat it. So if you face a draw, you're still getting beaten by the thing. Mm-hmm. And since our game is... Uh turn based you can't have a draw with another player so so it's uh if if you're on the last slot but it's not your turn and you would be able to defeat the end boss but someone else is uh in the turn before you and he's also there he or she then um then you lost uh, then then you you didn't win but the other person did <laughs> yeah mm-hmm 
Mm-hmm. And when now I now um I, now when it comes to when it comes to the when it, com, when it comes to the um the restart of the Kickstarter that you're planning for um sp for spring or summer of next year, um, is aside aside from just aside from just the date changes, will um are, is there anything that you that you foresee changing when it comes to the when it comes to that when it comes to that approach come come us uh, come next year we uh have a few changes planned mm -hmm. we got a lot of feedback after the kickstarter we asked mm -hmm. uh, our bakers and we asked around on our discord channel and we got the feedback that people would really enjoy it if we had like uh, standees or maybe acrylic standees or mm -hmm. miniatures since right now we only have tokens because well we lack the the skill to make uh the 3d models and stuff for miniatures mm -hmm. and it also uh will be more expensive to have those created but people really really want them so we'll do our very best to have something like that included all right and uh there will be a few changes to the design of the game uh i want to make the inventory space something that's actually um like a separate game mat so that when you have like a table in different format than just you know square players uh, set the, the inventory in front of them and they only have to reach to the middle where the um, where the board is located for moving their hero tokens not like to read the cards or something like that mm -hmm. so um, basically we want to upgrade the components of the game we want to put a lot more time into marketing beforehand since we slept a little bit on that mark and we want to um, improve the, uh, the the comfort of the players while playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, um, I can safely say that I'll that I'll be I'll be keeping a close eye on how on how that on how that develops, and I look forward to, um, to to that. Um, but with uh, but with that with that said, I do want to sincerely thank all of you for taking the time out of your out of your schedules and braving the hell that is time zones to come all the way up to the temple well thank you for having us it yes thank you very much yeah um and of course anytime you all see fit to return the door the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> awesome. and of okay mm -hmm. And of course, yeah. a since a sincere thanks goes to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more madness where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>